I just want the media to focus on it. But I want them to focus on it like closing your eyes and not looking at the person. And there's a lot of kind of stigma or utilization of words that are used when you're writing about African-American chefs or African-American food that media doesn't use for other writers, I mean, for other chefs. You're listening to The Taste Podcast. I'm Editor-in-Chief Matt Rodbard, here with Senior Editor Anna Hiesel. On today's show, Matt is talking to chef and cookbook author J.J. Johnson. Later, you'll hear me talking to Maggie Hoffman, the author of Batch Cocktails. J.J. Johnson just won a James Beard Award. He did win a James Beard Award, and guess what? We recorded this interview before the James Beard Awards, and I predicted that he would win a James Beard Award. Well done. I try. Honestly, though, Between Harlem and Heaven is an amazing book. Very well deserve it. He wrote it with Alexander Smalls and Veronica Chambers, and we talk about it. We also talk about a new restaurant that he's opening in Harlem, Field Trip, which is all about rice. Why rice? Why rice? Because rice is delicious. But also rice, as JJ says, is culture. And rice can tell so many stories about the history agriculture, and foodways. And as he points out, Anna, 93% of the world grew up eating rice. It's a remarkable stat. Here's Matt talking to J.J. Johnson. J.J. Johnson, welcome to the Taste Podcast. Thanks for having me. I've known you for about seven or eight years, I feel. Ooh, yeah, seven I feel like years, back yeah. going to the Cecil, Cecil. Cecil, we go way back to those times. You used to come there and eat and support. I appreciate you. Yeah, and you, but your rise in the chef world has been extraordinary because you've absolutely done an extraordinary job with the food and the cooking, but you also have um, your thought leader in food. You you've bring big ideas to the table and you enact them. One of them that's coming to life is your new restaurant, Field Trip. Yes, field trip. I like that you said a big thoughts that come to life. You're you are like some people like just talk 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 talk, but you actually <laughs> do things which I respect. Tell me about this new restaurant because there's a lot going on here in such a great way. So field trip is a quick uh, quick service restaurant that focuses on one key ingredient: rice. Um, the rices are the granddaddy grains or the grandma grains of the world. Uh, we are picking five of those rices. And these are rices that fueled communities for a really long time that are the lost grain. Um, and they'll be composed bowls uh, around those rices. Uh, the flavors will be made up around around that rice uh, in ways I've seen it in places around the world or uh, just reading or looking or knowing flavors that really go really well. So you'll see like a classic dish that you might have seen me done before, like pineapple black fried rice, but we'll be using the black china rice coming from Anson Mills uh, with some salmon and peri-peri. Uh, we're even, we're even going to do some coconut sticky rice with shrimp and green curry sauce. Um, I will do a jalaf rice with basmati, but mm-hmm. very biryani style mm, cool. with some like nana's bread and cucumbers and yogurt. Mm-hmm. You'll see a quinoa burger, two salads, mm-hmm. uh, some crab pockets. Exciting. And you have a sign that flashes rice is culture in the window. Oh, wow. Yeah, I have a sign that says rice is culture. So our slogan is rice is culture. So I love that. What does that mean? I mean, it's so true, but like unpack that a little bit. Well, I mean, 90, 93% of the world grew up on rice. Like the first thing you feed your kids is rice. Yeah. Right. We all grew up on rice. Rice has a really bad rep. It has mm-hmm. no respect in the game. <laughs> and I'm hoping to gain the respect back. So if you're thinking about what this rice shop is going to be, it's like the ramen noodle shop. Mm-hmm. It just has rice. It's true. When you say no respect, I think we're talking from the American point of view, because obviously in East Asia, rice is life and it's served from day zero. But in America, is it because of our aversion to carbs? Is it because rice has been served so poorly, meaning in a generic way that isn't necessarily delicious? I mean, no, I mean what? like rice here is bleached, yeah. it's enriched, and you're supposed to cook it really quickly. <laughs> and when people here, enri- when you see enriched, you think it's it's good for you, but all, all the n- nutritional factors are coming off of it. And bleached rice is like terrible. So we'll have no bleach, we'll have no bleach rice, no enriched rice. Um, this is gonna be real rice for real people. And rice as culture just means that every culture has rice as its foundation mm-hmm. or in the center of the table. Um, and everybody can relate to it. Uh, yeah, and that's our that's like our Nike slogan. Just do it. So. <laughs> it's smart. The branding is really cool too. Uh, let's talk about <laughs> this quinoa burger. 
I feel like that is going to be a winner because it's usually pretty bad, but obviously yours will not be bad. Yeah, I appreciate that. So to be on a steam steam bun, nice. uh, to be some quinoa, black beans, mushrooms, and they come with some smashed avocados and mozzarella, and then we're gonna and they come with some yuca puffs. So okay. the yuca puffs will be kind of like chicharrones, but uh, dehydrated uh, cassava. I have had a personal interest in fried rice for a while. Ooh. Fried rice around because I think fried rice is kind of you know, connected to East Asia, Japan, Korea, China. But obviously fried rice is done around the world. I'd love some examples. You are a rice expert. You wrote a cookbook. We'll talk about that about rice. But tell me some favorite fried rices. Uh, I mean, South Carolina, really good crab fried rice, like uh, Hannibal's. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Um, Singapore, Hawker's Market, uh, duck fried rice. Truly amazing with by using basmati with the super long grain. Um, but you do see the technique of fried rice around the world. We will have woks in the space with two of our rices being fried. Um, Carolina gold rice we will be frying. Um, and, the, and the goal, not the goal, is, but that tin pan is used to cook rice so because it can maintain really high heat. So you also see it in like Israel or Persian food, right, or mm-hmm. Pakistan because you use that, that vessel to get the crispy rice yeah. on the bottom. Um, so yeah, you see in Japan and Southeast Asia, but it is a tool that you see around the world and everybody does make fried rice or they assume they make the best fried rice. (laughs) Hopefully you'll be getting some really clean fried rice with us at Field Trip. I love it. Um, I want to hear a little bit more about the book, which is nominated for a James Beard Award. When we run this, we will know if you've won or not, but let's just pretend you win. So we'll call it your James Beard winning and predicting (laughs) a future. Don't jinx me. I won't jinx you. But uh, no one will know this because it's in the future. Let's talk about the book, though. I'd love to hear uh, the, uh, what, when you went into write Between Harlem and Heaven, uh, what were you trying to do? So, you know, when I wrote Between Harlem and Heaven, I was still at the Cecil with Alexander Smalls. Um, I went to Alexander. He was working on a book at that time. I went to Alexander and said, hey, Alexander, you know, I really love to write a Cecil cookbook because it, there's nothing on the shelf like it. And it, I would really love to have a book on the shelf that was kind of like Aquavi mm-hmm. or Per Se. Um, those books are standout books that are always around, and you utilize those books for really for moments and styles of cooking. Um, and Between Harlem and Heaven was that book that you can reach and use as the foundation for the African-American diaspora to realize that there's this different style of food than just soul food, and it's all around the world. And we were, we were just showing you the incorporation of like the, the Asian migrant workers. And we worked two years on that book, 100 Recipes. Veronica Chambers was, is, was a, alongside writer, the great Veronica Chambers. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, you get some essays about Harlem. You get some essays about, about my life. Um, and I really just walk you through uh, what I believe is the true foundation of the African diaspora. Hey, let's, let's tackle African-American cuisine in America. Uh, are, you, are, you, are we covering it? As food journalists, are we covering it in the way that you think is effective? Um, are there areas that you wish the media was focusing on more? I just want the media to focus on it. Yeah, sure. I agree. But I want them to focus on it like like just closing your eyes and writing the piece or closing your eyes and not looking at the person. And there's a lot of kind of stigma or utilization of words that are used when you're writing about African-American chefs or African-American food that you don't, that media doesn't use for other writers, I mean, for other chefs. But they're just tropes we fall into and also just soul food in general. Or just like when when somebody opened, like, uh, what was it? What was the article that somebody wrote about me when I first opened the Henry and I was slightly upset about and they used some words or like unique ingredients or um, big and bold it's like, well, everybody kind of cooks big and bold, yeah. but you don't utilize, you don't say that mm-hmm. when you're writing about other people. So yeah, just cover your eyes and kind of, kind of, mm-hmm. kind of go in there and just taste the food. And there's a feeling that you get yeah. to when you're when you're eating, and just write about that. And if you don't know about it, then bring along some people that do know about it yeah. so that they can educate you. And I think that will help push the envelope uh, on food writing. Yeah, I, I was going to say about soul food, too, um, as as wonderful as the cooking is, I think it is a bit of a trap for food writers to focus on only soul food because you look around America, you look at Gula Cuisine in South Carolina, you look at barbecue in mm-hmm. in Southern California, in Compton, you look at Texas, 
cuisine. And these are all areas that I think food media is... Like is Mississippi. Of course, Mississippi. Upper Midwest, African-American right. food. Yeah, I think just as a, as a journalist... Um, I think at Taste we've tried we've tried to cover African American food experience, but we just can't publish enough stories because there's just so much to write about. No, there's so much to write about, and I have you know I'm, I have a a big feeling in this area. I'm, there's a lot of writers out there that have, have heard my mouth about <laughs> it, and I just want people when they when writers are writing about or they're thinking about writing about anybody, they should be writing fairly about everybody. Sure, right? And I think what's occurring is that you forget about one type of person when you want to start writing about another type of person. So you'll see in the media that we're forgetting about white men, but we're writing about women and African Americans. But that's really what happened to African Americans and women for the last 10 to 15 years. So that doesn't make it right either. There has to be some type of balance and, uh, what's the tech word? algorithm <laughs> to writing of to make sure that we're covering everybody and we're getting all thought process. It algorithm is the editor. Mm-hmm. I'll just step in and say that the editor <laughs> is the algorithm in media. And I think it's the editor's job. And I think my colleagues around in food media have, have done a, a pretty good job at covering uh, the cuisine of African Americans. But obviously we just need to do more because it's just is overlooked. Yeah, no, it is. And it, look at different regions and different foods and, I think I think uh, Jordana's uh, best new chef list was really good and yeah. thoughtful this year. She definitely got on the road and looked at some some good people. Yeah, um, and, and went to some places that typically the average person wouldn't have went to. I mean, she was in Puerto Rico when I was in Puerto Rico, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and I remember hitting her up and like, come to the east side of Puerto Rico and mm-hmm. check out these hawker markets. Oh, word. And I'm not sure if she went all the way yeah. over there, but that's yeah. the reason why my wife didn't know that I stayed on that side of Puerto Rico for. Uh-huh. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah. Media needs to just cover in thoughtful ways. Yeah. I want to talk about the idea of putting on dishes that are have historical significance, but maybe aren't big sellers. Have you ever struggled with that at your restaurants where you wanted to make a statement or you really just loved a dish because of this history or because of, I'm not going to use the word traditional, but I know listeners will know what we mean by that. But like the, you still have to run a business. There's still margins. Yeah, so the way I design my menus, I design I, like I stop cooking for myself and I cook for the people, and I I think I know what people want, and then I JJify that. So <laughs> I love the it. Henry, <laughs> there always will be peri peri yasa West African peanut so- sauce. Uh, the short ribs will always be there, but taking the way of styles that you cook or your cooking technique, and then applying that to certain dishes to get those flavors. Yasa. On um, Pusan might not work that well, but yasa with mushrooms work amazing, and people love mushrooms, and yasa and mushrooms go really good together. So just figuring out the balance, because it is a business, and you have to be able to pay your staff and your oh, rent and your taxes and all that good stuff. And not just in any city. You're talking about New York City, which is probably the most difficult city in America to run a restaurant because of real estate issues and because of margins being so tight. I mean, I, I, how does it work? Yeah, I mean, real estate is tough. I think there's some other things that are that are, that are slightly harder than real estate in restaurants in New York City. Um, the inconsistency of the health department, the the the, the tax, the taxes in, that you pay on a building versus maybe your rent, so the landlord doesn't have to pay the taxes, so you're absorbing that. Nobody talks about that. The utilization of the tip pool. How back of house employees pay, maybe in an open kitchen mm-hmm. can't be in the tip pool, but they're interacting with guests, so they can't get a higher margin uh, or wage. Um, How is minimum wage affecting your restaurants? It's 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 risen in New York. So minimum, yeah, minimum wage in New York has, is 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 risen. Um, for for us. April, I, oh, so April in New York was, I think, as across the board, been a tough month for every mm. uh, restaurant in New York. Nobody knows why. We've all been seeing a a decrease in sales, uh, but maintaining the same check average. Mm. And we don't know if that's because certain people went up on price. We don't know if that's because people are scared of a government shutdown or going. We hear, we hear these rumors about going into a new recession. Mm-hmm. Um so April's been a little rocky in the restaurant industry in New York City across the board. I don't know how it is in the rest of the country. I think you have to start looking at, 
I think the perfect example to look at is like the Smith and looking at hmm. a lot of people look at the check average versus the amount of butts you're putting in the seats. And if you can put the amount of butts in the seats and still be able to get to the check average, then you win. So it's like the McDonald's method. Do volume. Volume, volume. Over, over quantity. Yeah. I mean, that's the ideal at Field Trip. Our prices are pretty yeah. moderate. Yeah. And hopefully we capture the volume. And if we don't, then we'll go up on prices. Uh, but we see Chipotle in those neighborhoods doing well. So, uh, you know, $15 an hour is still not a lot of money. No. Um, but I think there's a way to – I wish if New York – uh, policies made it easier to make it fair. I think the tip pool could be really good if everybody was in the tip pool. Everybody's giving a customer experience. And how do we do that? I'm not really sure. And why can't we do that? I'm unsure of that either. Yeah, and thank you for sharing those those points because we do talk a lot on the Taste Podcast about real estate with several of the critics, but we haven't talked about health, the health department and the inconsistency and just shuttering places and how that really affects the bottom line. I want to hear a little bit more about Field Trip, about how do you get your customers to like crave these bowls of rice and come back because that's what Sweetgreen does. That's what Chipotle does. That's what McDonald's does in a way. It's like the special sauce, right? Pun intended. Uh, Yes. The special sauce uh, or the swag. The Um, swag. (laughs) Love that better. Good one. The, uh, we, uh, we, we launched field trip at the U S open this past year. We learned a lot about the brand. Um, we definitely had some craveable moments in at U S open how do you get that? I'm still unsure. I pray every day that when <laughs> I open the doors in the next couple of weeks that um, people will be coming back and craving these bowls of rice uh, that they can't get anywhere else. Um, I think it's the luck of well, the luck of the draw. I talked to Nicholas J- Jame about it at Sweet Green and said, how do you do it? You know, they, they advised me to go back to Harlem. Mm-hmm. Um, I originally asked them for investment money and they said, I think you shouldn't look at anywhere else in New York City. I think you should really look at Harlem. You have yeah. you have pockets of people there that really support you. Um, and I think that's what it really is. It's really about the pockets of people. And if you have the pockets of people in a neighborhood that are want your food or get it on delivery, then you're, you're kind of good. It's kind of like that Indian restaurant that doesn't have anybody sitting in it and you're trying to figure out how they've been around for 25 years. They're the ones delivering to everybody in your neighborhood. So you're going to have a pretty like good delivery game going. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to be using, I'm going to be on Seamless and, yeah. uh, and Grubhub. There's no reason yeah. I shouldn't be. And um, I live in that neighborhood. I'm always looking for delivery options yeah. and I'm looking forward to ordering delivery from my own restaurant from time to time. <laughs> um and I think everybody else will be um, excited to have a so-called new option and something that we've never had before. You offer a menu item called "It Was All a Dream." We used to read Word Up magazine. Definitely, I was just at the <laughs> Nets. I was at the Nets game last night. It was Biggie night. The Nets lost. We won't talk about that. But Biggie was everywhere. They played the game that song like four times. What is this dish? It's like three hundred twenty-five bucks. About yeah, so it's three hundred sixty bucks. You Six. get every item on the menu when you come to the Henry. Um, I recommend it for tables four or more. You get the full experience. If you want to really ball out, you can add yeah. on some magnums and really have a good time. You know, everything that I'm doing today in restaurants are all about fun. Uh, people should come out and have a really great time, but also a really amazing dining experience. Um, I don't believe the diner wants to be in a stuffy dining room anymore and listen to elevator music. Uh, the music is loud and um, all a dream kind of brings you to that <laughs> moment of celebration. We celebrate it with you mm-hmm. and um, come by and, and try one. Yeah, what are you cooking at the Henry? We haven't talked too much about that menu. Uh, the Henry has uh, shrimp and pork dumplings with Harlem curry. The the, the pork and the dumpling is some linguisa. Uh, we do hen of the wood mushroom yasa. The yasa has Aleppo and some lime segments and cilantro. Uh, we do jerk chicken. I make a jerk uh, vinaigrette with some rice and peas. Um, and some soy braised collard greens, some dishes you'll start to see on the menu for spring. I'm going to do uh, a black eyed pea stew with halibut, um, these plantain kelawelles that are with some codfish inside. Beautiful. Um, I'm going to do like eat and peel prawns that are head on with peri peri sauce and like a kiwi slaw, uh, and then a jicama watermelon uh, salad with some. African and so, if you ordered, if you ordered the, it was all a dream. You get all of that, maybe a magnum. Yeah, you live, you live, you live the best life, and it's not expensive. Think if you come with six people and you get an all a dream, it's sixty dollars a person. You throw a magnum, 
It's like a hundred bucks, you, yeah. you're living good. And it's looking good. That's a you're great deal. Good. Let's talk about travel because you talked about traveling to Puerto Rico. And if you just, just the dishes you, you, you list, um, clearly you're informed by the world. Do you have any really cool trips coming up that you can talk about? So this year I was supposed to go and cook in Nigeria. I was invited to go there and cook. I said no just because I'm opening a restaurant. Yeah. I would say 2020 is going to be a big travel year for me. Definitely going back to West Africa. Um, no, I went to Puerto Rico on my first family trip. We stayed on the east side of Puerto Rico. Took my kids to a hawker's market. We were eating like... Um, uh, octopus ceviche with like fresh tostones and like special sauce. Uh, was, you, I don't know if you ever go to if you ever in the Bronx, you can get like the, um, these coconut this coconut sorbet, but it's made with water and like co- co- it's made with coconut water and coconut cream. It's so good. Can't think of the name. Right yeah, now. what's the name of the spot? I'd like to go in the, in uh, in the Bronx. Is oh, there like the a Bronx? place that you can? No, buy? you just gotta look for that it's person just on the in, corner in, on the with the car. You could probably okay. when then you go to a Yankee game. Yeah, yeah you could no. probably catch it. Mets man, sorry, <laughs> can't go to a Yankees game. Sorry, sports. Um, but where would you want to travel though? If you had anywhere in the world, I, I just want to hear because you you really think about these things and you have these these goals, these big goals. Yeah, I mean, next year definitely for me is Nigeria, Morocco, Senegal, um, for for West Africa. Um, after that, I really want to see the Afro Coast of Peru. Mm-hmm. Uh, I want to get into. I want to go into Colombia and kind of see some of that food. It's on the rise and has mm-hmm. a huge Afro. Um, Mm-hmm. Impact, um, so those are kind of kind of the areas I'm going to go. I'll probably travel somewhere really really cool for my birthday this year. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking about just celebrating with friends and going to the U.S. Virgin Islands mm-hmm. um, and checking out Digby and seeing what he's doing down there. So you know, just supporting each other. Yeah. Um, I really want to do Blackberry Farm, but I just can't afford it. So. <laughs> Just gotta do a dinner there. I know. Maybe I have to yeah, do it the reverse way. Do it the reverse. Do a call in the favor. Go a couple days early. Get to stay at the. I've never been there. I have no idea what the place is. Oh, like. it's it seems, crazy. Seems I've been one time for uh, with the Southern Food Alliance. Seems pretty day. cool. We ask all guests on the Taste Podcast if there was a dream cookbook project in your future with no budget or deadlines or time constraints. Ooh, what would that be, JJ? Uh the next cookbook I'm going to write is going to be a rice book. Um, I would say that's my dream project uh, and really showing rice's culture and these and traveling and really showing it, going to rice farms all around the world and showing the culture through the book that way, um, including some of the best writers, collective of writers mm-hmm. to, to, to write in the book. Like it. So you're, you're more of an editor than a writer you're bringing back you're bringing together voices i'm into yeah, that bringing the i mean rice rice every rice grain has a voice everybody yeah. looks at rice differently um so you know that that's 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 where i go maybe you know under this maybe the next book will be underneath this roof you just never know <laughs> <laughs> jj johnson thank you for joining the taste podcast thanks for having me it was a pleasure Here's Anna talking to author Maggie Hoffman. Welcome to the Taste Podcast, Maggie. Thanks so much for having me. I love the idea of your new book because I really like having cocktail parties. I like drinking cocktails. But just kind of practically speaking, if I have more than two or three friends over, I kind of ditch the whole cocktail idea because it can be a little fussy when you're making them for everyone. Totally. I think when we have friends over, we want to be the best versions of ourselves, which is, you know, not the stressed out version. And you don't want to be knocking over a cocktail shaker or searching for bitters or trying to get the shaker open. And so trying to find the recipe on your phone (laughs) to remember what the ratios are for, you know, a Manhattan. Yeah, so this is a book of recipes that you can make before your guests arrive so that you can just hang out with them, which is sort of the point. I love that. Speaking of which, before you arrived to the podcast studio, you mixed some cocktails for us. I did in my hotel room. What an exciting morning at the taste office. This is a little morning cocktail. What did you bring for us? Um, I brought the happiness, which is one of my favorite cocktails in the book because it's so simple. Um, It was created by a bartender named Mark Sassi in Seattle. 
Um, and it's essentially a reverse Manhattan. So normally when you'd make a Manhattan, you'd have quite a bit of bourbon and a little bit of sweet vermouth. Um, but here you're sort of spotlighting the sweet vermouth. So it's twice as much of that and less bourbon um, with a little bit of bitters. And what I love about this drink is it's not too high in alcohol. You can have a couple of them. It's really flavorful uh, and you can definitely make it ahead. Um and in this book, you sort of have two options. One is to mix everything together uh, with the water that would dilute the cocktail. So every cocktail you've ever had has been mixed with water, whether a bartender has stirred it with ice or shaken it. And sometimes people forget that that's a really important ingredient. Um, so the recipes here tell you exactly how much water to add. Um, if you want to get really nerdy, you can also leave the water out and... Take this bottle of cocktails, whether it's a mason jar or a glass bottle, um, and put it in your fridge and age it. Uh, and so we just opened one, a bottle of this drink that I had finished uh, batching around the time that I turned in the manuscript. So it's uh, more than a year old, and it was so delicious. So that's the one I had earlier this week, so we'll see how this fresh one uh, matches up. I can't wait to try it. So you are pouring this with ice, even though it's already a little bit diluted with water. Yeah, I like it. I like it with ice. Um, in the book, uh, the recipes tell you exactly how much ice or water to add. And, you know, some drinks you want to linger over and you want them to stay cold. And so having a little ice in the glass will keep it that way. Um, and so in general, if the drinks tell you to pour it over ice, then you're usually just having it in your fridge so it's at the right temperature to sip with a little ice. If you're going to drink it up in a coupe glass or a, a martini glass, then you'd usually put the bottle in your freezer. Um, and so then it's really, really chilled and doesn't need the ice to stay cold. What Are there rules about what you can put in your freezer and what you can't? I always worry about like a bottle exploding sure. or some kind of disaster like that. Sure. What, um, are, the, what, are, what are the guidelines for... For what you can freeze. The most important guideline for the freezer, uh, which I learned from experience, is you definitely want to put anything in the freezer actually inside the freezer and not on the door because the shelves of the freezer are often not that well attached. And especially <laughs> if you have a glass bottle, you don't want it falling out of the door. One of many things you probably learned while recipe testing mm -hmm. the book. Another piece of advice not to do with the freezer is to be sure to label things during the course of this testing. I had a ton of little jars and would think, oh, I'm just going to remember that this is half a batch of this and this is something else. And one day my husband went in the fridge and poured himself a drink and said, Maggie, this isn't that good. And I was like, well, we I was trying a few different versions of something to get down to the final. And then I realized he had poured himself a glass of honey syrup. Gross. <laughs> so that was that's not recommended. Be sure to label everything. Um, for the freezer, most of these drinks have enough alcohol that you're not going to be worried about exploding. It's not like a bottle of champagne that's going to cost cause a mess in your fridge. But the the truth is that your freezer will get colder and colder and colder. And so if you want to pull a drink out and drink it immediately, you probably want it around like 22 degrees. So most of the drinks in this book will suggest that if you're going to batch far in advance, you put it in your fridge uh, and then throw it in the freezer about two hours before serving so that it's not so, so icy cold. At really cold temperatures, you're not going to taste all that much. Yeah. So you kind of want a, t a temperature right between the fridge and the freezer, mm -hmm. somewhere mm -hmm. in the middle ground. Let's taste the happiness. Cheers. Cheers. Mmm, that's great. It's more uh, kind of round and mellow than I usually think of Manhattan's being. Exactly. So that's the sweet vermouth. And I used Carpano Antica, which is a lovely Italian vermouth that you can drink on its own. Uh, but a little bit of bourbon and bitters helps. Yeah. So tell me about what actually happens to a cocktail when it's in the fridge, like over the course of a week, a month, as you mentioned, many months. Yeah. So most of the drinks in this book, probably people are going to make them the day they're going to serve them, you know, get up in the morning and get all prepped for a party. That's really what they're meant for. Um, and the pitchers are all drinks 
that have fresh ingredients that you don't want to leave in the fridge for long. You want your fresh juices to be made the day they're going to be served. If if you're going to go to the trouble of making fresh lemon juice, you want to do it, you know, serve it really when it's delicious. Um, but the drinks that are sort of in the stirred style where you're pouring vermouth and spirits and that kind of thing uh, into a bottle, uh, there's a list of them called drinks that keep uh, in the front of the book. And those drinks do taste great with some aging. And, you know, I tested, it was a little crazy, but I tested each of them multiple ways. So I made each of the drinks uh, undiluted as well as diluted and with bitters and without bitters and with the water, but no bitters and with the water, with mm-hmm. bitters and all the different variations. And I, and I batched them all up and I got a dorm fridge and had all these different testers. And then we tested them about a week out and two weeks out and a month and two months and three months. And, um, I was a little surprised at what happened because I was pretty confident. I'd heard from a lot of bartenders certain advice um, that turned out not to be true according to our blind tasting. So all of the recipes in the book are perfect for batching as is if you're going to serve it within a week or two. There's really not much difference whether you include the water or don't include the water. Um, But it seems that if you're doing that nerdy experiment of keeping a cocktail long term, you definitely want to keep it in your fridge. I had a few I kept out just to see those were gross. Uh, You definitely want to keep it in your fridge. If you're doing a month or two months, like if you want to make a special a holiday gift that you're going to give people beautiful little glass bottles of a cocktail. You could totally do that now, but I would leave the water and bitters out. And then when you're giving the gift, um, add the water and bitters or when you're ready to serve. Um, and if you want to taste it at different times and sort of check in, I would split the batch in two so that you're not exposing one of them to a lot of air. Um, because the it's oxidation just like, actually exactly. affects the flavor. Just like wine, vermouth is uh, going to get oxidized over time. Is batching a technique that a lot of bartenders use? Um as as an for its advantages outside of just the convenience of it absolutely i mean i think something that's happened since the early days of the craft cocktail revival uh, is that there was a time when you'd go into a bar and be willing to wait 15 minutes for a drink. And that time has passed. You kind of expect to get great cocktails wherever you are uh, quickly, you know, in restaurants and bars. And so uh, I think the quality of cocktails in bars overall has gone up as they've started to batch to be able to have really complex drinks that could have 12 ingredients, but they're just pouring from one bottle. Right. Often when I'm sort of planning a party and I'm thinking about a drink that I can make on a large scale ahead of time, I think about punches. But what is the difference between a punch and a batch cocktail? That's a really good question. Um, You know, I think when people think about punch, there's sort of two things they think about. Uh, One is sort of like college style, like throw it in a bowl. You know, maybe there's something fruity and something fizzy. Jungle juice. (laughs) And then, you know, so that I think that's probably most of the people in the country think about punch as sort of this like a random, um, juicy, lightly alcoholic thing. Just emptying a lot of bottles into a big bowl usually. Right. And then there are nerdy people who might think um, of the historical punch. You know, uh, there's a great book called Punch by David Wondrich that um, got into the history of punches that, you know, have a long, long history of uh, sort of being lighter. And the, the old formula is one part sour, one part sweet, four parts strong, six parts weak. And that, you know, that goes way, way back. Um, and those are really light and you're meant to be able to drink them and drink them. Um, and some of the drinks in this book are punches for sure. The book is organized by flavor profile. So if you're looking for fruity or if you're looking for herbal, you'll see those. Um, but I think when people think about cocktails and especially the modern cocktails you're seeing 
Nowadays in bars, they're bolder, they're punchier. Like this drink we're drinking is really a cocktail. It's not a punch. Um, so I think this book has sort of the whole range and the way to sort of find your signature drink is to think about the mood of the gathering that you're having. Is it an elegant dinner party where you want something served in a fancy glass or is it, you know, a brunch where you want something a little bit lighter? Um, and so there's kind of the whole range, but they're all very up to date from amazing bartenders all over the country. How important is the actual ice in this whole equation? I mean, I always wonder this about any cocktail, but are you the kind of person who has like an ice crusher in your kitchen and like six different shapes of ice cubes in your freezer? I don't. Uh... I do love a big ice cube, mostly because it's pretty. Mm -hmm. um, but I think as long as you are, you have enough ice, you don't want just like a few sad little cubes that are just going to immediately turn into water. Ice keeps ice cold. So if the best way to get a lot of ice is to go to your corner deli and buy a bunch of bags and put them in your bathtub, that's a great way to do it and just have plenty of ice. And also I think it's good to put your guests to work a little bit. You know, have someone says, oh, I'm going to be about 20 minutes late. You say, great, bring some ice with you. Yeah. You talk a little bit in the book also about all like kind of how deep ice nerdiness goes like there are people who freeze giant blocks of ice in coolers mm -hmm. can you talk about why people would why anyone would do that well camper english who's uh, another booze writer in san francisco where i live uh, has done amazing research um, he has a website called alcademics and he's been testing how to make that beautiful clear ice that you see in a fancy cocktail bar at home but it involves putting an open cooler into your freezer so you uh, have to have a, it, like a huge freezer yeah. somehow <laughs> so i've never done that um i do like those silicone um, large cube trays. And so I'll do that. And if you want to make crushed ice, you can just uh, get out your like meat tenderizer. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a good way to do it. It might upset your neighbors a little bit, I guess. <laughs> I Like, you probably have to wrap it in a cloth bag of some kind. Yeah, right? I usually do like a Ziploc bag and then wrap a, a like dish towel around it. Have you ever used one of those old-timey ice crusher crankers that they sell on eBay now? I love those, but I don't have very much counter space. That's fair. I always I'm I always find them appealing when I see them on eBay. Let's talk about a few of the specific cocktails from the book. Um, one of them that looked amazing, partially because of the name to me, was the Infinity Pool. Love that. Um, it's just like a beautiful kind of bright or like yellow green color, and it has mezcal, uh, celery bitters celery juice, lemon juice. How do you make celery juice? Is that something you can buy or do I need like an industrial size vegetable juicer? Um, the easiest way to get celery juice is definitely to go to a juice shop that will make, you know, breakfast juices and order up a cup of celery juice. That's definitely the easiest way to do it if you have a juice shop nearby, which lots of cities do. Um, a vegetable juicer is great and very efficient. If you don't, you can also just uh, cut up the celery in a blender for a minute um, and then strain the juice, and that's sort of a slower, slower way of doing it. Cool. How much do you need to blend in order to yield? I can't remember how much celery I juice think, it calls for. Um, to do the full batch, which is about 10 servings, about a dozen stalks of celery in the blender. Okay, um, that's like about a bunch of celery. Maybe two bunches just to be safe. You could always do a little garnish. Um, it's definitely much easier in a juicer. Uh, we just made this drink um, for the release party uh, that I had in San Francisco, and I ended up with way more celery than I needed because I had calculated for a blender, but we did have a juicer. Um, and it's a really cool drink because it's really refreshing. It's not too sweet. It has kind of the tartness of a margarita. Um, and if you like mezcal, it's got that lovely sort of earthy, earthy flavor. Um, and what I love to garnish it with is a little bit of smoked sea salt, which also has that sort of uh, earthy, smoky flavor. Wow. Speaking of the kind of like mixture of smoky, salty flavors, there is a recipe for a martini that uses peaty scotch. 
I have never heard of that before. Like, how do you make that work? It's a vodka martini, right? Yeah. I mean, I think in some ways it's a vodka martini, which is called the kangaroo. Uh, But it's sort of uh, for people who love a dirty martini. If you love to put like the brine from olives in your martini, this is a drink for you because it kind of amps up that olivey flavor a few different ways. So the scotch has that really earthy, meaty flavor that you might get from olives. Um, And you actually put a few olives into the batch, into the bottle. Um, and there's a little bit of brine. And then at the very end, you add just a little bit of olive oil. Um, so the whole thing is really luxurious and definitely savory. Um, and if you're into olives, it's a really fun thing to try. And is that one, that one's also finished with a little bit of salt, right? Yeah. Yeah. You, um, have a pinch of salt in it, which often works to sort of round out a cocktail. A lot of cocktails can use a little pinch of salt. Um, And then another thing I like to do is freeze some olives uh, and use those as the garnish because they'll help the drink stay cold. I love that. Little olive ice cubes. Also on the savory topic, you have a Jägermeister Bloody Mary in the book. I guess my question is just like, why Jägermeister? That's like, that's got to be a hard sell to get people to drink Jäger Bloody Marys. I think that many people who are starting to drink Amari and Digestivo uh, may be surprised if they go back to Jägermeister. If you've been drinking Fernet, which a lot of people have in the last couple of years, you may be surprised. Jägermeister is a lot like Underberg, you know, the, those little bottles that you sometimes get as a digestif in um, restaurants. Kind uh, of that medicinal flavor. Yeah, it's, it has saffron and ginger and citrus peel and anise. And, you know, it's just another one of those... Amari, and it has a lot of spice, and so that's actually really great in a Bloody Mary. Um, this one has allspice and chipotle, and so it's really bold and flavorful. I don't think you really taste the Jaeger separate from the other spices in the mix. It just makes the whole thing really spicy and full-flavored, um, and so it's just a really bold Bloody Mary that actually doesn't have a ton of alcohol in it because you're using the Jaeger but not additional vodka or you know, tequila or whatever you usually add. Um, And this one also has a little bit of Guinness, which really um, kind of dries it out. So you're not just getting like a sweet tomato juice. So it's a really delicious drink that I think is sort of like, just try it. You might love it. (laughs) Cool. All right. You kind of sold me on that. Are there any other uh, drinks in the book that have Jaeger? Uh, You know, the... Because I think everyone who has a bottle um, often then wonders, like, okay, what else can I use this for? Um, There are sections at the bottom of a lot of the recipes that talk about other ways to use it. Um, So one of the things I love to do is to do a 50-50 with Jägermeister and rye, like a high-proof rye, like Rittenhouse, so there's a bunch of them. Um, And I like to do that on a big ice cube at the end of the night. And there's something about the, like, spicy rye and the spicy amaro that's really great. Um, and you can also do the same thing with the Jägermeister and Mezcal 50-50. So you don't really need to measure. It's just half and half, you know, use a little shot glass or a, a little measuring cup. Um, and you can bottle it up and have it in your fridge or just pour it at the end of the night. I love that because it's just two things that I would never think to really pair up. Let's talk a little bit more about beer in batch cocktails. That, I would imagine, is something you kind of just add at the end so that it doesn't get flat, right? Yeah, exactly. Are there other recipes in the book that call for beer? There or are, bubbly components that you yeah. add at the end? There are a handful. I love beer in cocktails because it's not sweet. Um, there's a great one that has a spicy um, serrano syrup um, and a little bit of rye and uh, honey. And you use a pilsner or a kolsch. So it's really refreshing, really good for a hot day. And yeah, you can just um, have your batch that has everything that isn't beer and then sort of have people do mix them half and half in their glass and taste it and adjust it to their taste. I mean, I think people forget sometimes that making cocktails is like cooking. 
Um, and so you do want to taste as you go. And, you know, your local breweries, Pilsner or Kolsch, might be a little different from mine. Um, and so you might find that you like it with two-thirds beer and one-third pitcher mix, um, and that's fine. And it's the same thing with sparkling wine. You know, some Proseccos are very dry and some are very sweet, and it's fine to taste and say, taste your pitcher and say, okay, I think this, because this Prosecco is a little sweeter than the one she used, I need a little more lemon. Um, And I think people can just trust their gut on that. Yeah, I love making champagne cocktails where, well, I love spogliatos, for instance. And sometimes I just mix a little pitcher of the Campari and vermouth that people can add to taste to their glasses of champagne. I love that. You can kind of judge by color, by by your personal taste. Right, and everyone might like a different percentage, and that's fine. What's kind of like a wacky wild card pick from the book that you really want people to give a try? Hmm. I mean, Jägermeister, Bloody Mary, of course. <laughs> what else? What should people try? Um, ooh, I mean, there's sort of something for everyone. You know, when it gets to be warmer weather, there's a lot with fresh produce, which is fun. There's one where you blend cantaloupe and gin in a blender to sort of quick infuse it, which I like. Another one of my favorites, I'm a big mezcal drinker, and another one of my favorites is a watermelon juice drink that has spicy vodka and mezcal, and it's sort of like a barbecue in a glass. I really dig that. So I'm getting excited for summer. Yeah, me too. Maggie, thank you so much for coming on the Taste Podcast. Thanks so much for having me. And thank you for bringing the happiness to us. The Taste Podcast is hosted by Matt Rodbard and me, Anna Hiesel. The show is produced by Gabrielle Lewis. Studio recordings by Pat Stango. Theme music by Steve Rydell. Interviews are recorded live at Books Are Magic in Cobble Hill, Brooklyn and at Penguin Random House Studios in Manhattan. Visit Taste online at tastecooking.com. Thanks for listening.